Um, we have three different papers that will be presented, and they give three different perspective, perspectives. The speakers decided on the order to go from east to west. That is, we start with a talk from Berlin, from the Potsdam Institute, uh, by Matthias Schmidt. Hello, everybody. I'm very glad to be here and to have the opportunity to present some work on climate targets and uncertainty and that I've done in collaboration with Alex Lorenz, Hermann Held, and Emma Kriegel at the Potsdam Institute. Maybe you've heard the recommendation to start a talk with a little anecdote or a quote to catch the audience's attention, which might be necessary at four in the afternoon. The problem with quotes is that they easily sound a bit precautious, but with the help of Google, I found an, as I think, refreshing little slogan, which is that the bend in the road is not the end of the road unless you're unable to take the turn. <laughs> well, actually speaking, the main point of my talk is that if the road in climate change is defined by probabilistic guardrails, probabilistic climate targets, then we cannot study bands in the road in the form of new information. We have to look for different decision criteria. The content of the talk is as follows. In the introduction, I want to pose the question why climate targets are useful and formulate cost-effectiveness analysis under uncertainty. Then in the core of the talk, I want to discuss three major concepts of laws of cost-effectiveness analysis, which are dynamic inconsistencies. The expected value of information can become negative and targets become infeasible due to learning. In consequence, we have been looking for alternative decision criteria that I shortly want to present in part three, and finally, I conclude. So why are climate targets useful? First of all, climate targets have practical advantages. They are suitable for national and international negotiations. They can be used as an interface between politics and science. Politicians need aggregate information about the climate system. Science, scientists, in turn, need aggregate normative judgments from politicians, and also as an interface between the natural and the social sciences, because climate targets can be assessed and evaluated both in a biogeochemical model, for example, and an economic growth model. And then more vaguely, climate targets are hoped to raise public, public awareness, stimulate investment, change consumer behavior, and so on and so forth. And then more from a theoretical point of view, climate targets are a simple way to formulate a precautionary approach. We don't know, as we have heard in the previous sessions, a lot about a world beyond 2 degrees centigrade warming. There's deep uncertainty, potential tipping points. And one might argue that we know more about a carbon-free world, so the precautionary approach is to limit global warming. And then last advantage of climate targets, a minor advantage is that uh, results from cost-effectiveness analysis are far less sensitive to the specific form of the utility function, which is highly controversial, such parameters as the pure social time preference. Now I want to formulate cost-effectiveness analysis first without uncertainty, the standard case, then with uncertainty, and finally with learning about uncertainty. Normally, cost-effectiveness analysis is formulated as a cost minimization under a target, which is formulated as a constraint. What we do instead is we maximize a social welfare function such that temperature does not exceed 2 degrees centigrade, which is the European climate target. The model we use, by the way, is called MIND is similar to the DICE model due to William Nordhaus, but includes an endogenous technological change has a crudely resolved energy sector, and carbon capture and sequestration is also considered. We can then, for example, do a sensitivity analysis of cost-effective emissions with respect to climate sensitivity theta, which is shown on the right. So we vary climate sensitivity in the IPCC likely range from 2 to 4.5 degrees centigrade, and we see that, indeed, they are very sensitive to climate sensitivity, and we do not get any robust policy recommendations. In 2050, emissions vary by roughly a factor of six. That doesn't come as a surprise, so we have to include uncertainty explicitly. It doesn't make sense to demand that the climate target is met for all possible values of all possible uncertain parameters. And arguably, or arguably the most natural way to formulate climate targets under uncertainty is by limiting the probability of crossing the target. So now we maximize expected utility such that the probability of crossing the 2 degree centigrade target is smaller than a new parameter Q, which is a new normative parameter that might be called a risk tolerance. The resulting problem is called a chance constraint program problem in the mathematical program literature and was discussed in detail by Hermann Held et al. in a recent paper in energy economics. As you know, uncertainty is not the end of the story. We also know that we will learn about uncertainty in the future. So now we consider one time learning as shown in the left hand graph. We have a prior on climate sensitivity, which is the black curve, and seven posteriors, which are the colored curves. Now there's, uh, by the way, we got this information structure as an estimate for learning about climate sensitivity from mere global mean temperature measurements. 
we followed a paper by David Kelly and Charles Colstead and fitted an AR1 stochastic process to the temperature record, could then generate random temperature time series for the future and perform a Bayesian updating on one uncertain parameter in this AR1 process. Just as an aside, that's how we got this information structure on climate sensitivity. So now there's one, more than one way to formulate cost effectiveness analysis with learning. And arguably intuitive one is to maximize still expected utility. Now expectation first with respect to the posterior and then with respect to the message of M. And we limit the probability of crossing the target each individual posterior. So for each posterior or message M, we limit the probability of crossing the target two degrees centigrade to Q. We can then again calculate cost effective emissions shown on the right. And the most striking feature is that emissions before learning in the case of learning, which is the solid orange line, are far more reduced than in the case without learning, which is the solid green line. This is already a sign for the conceptual flaws that I now want to turn to. The first conceptual flaw is that cost effectiveness analysis, both with learning and also without learning, uh, is potentially dynamically inconsistent. What we limited was the probability of crossing the target whenever. This constraint is not separable in time. It's not a set of separate constraints at each, point, at each point in time. And as a consequence, the decision maker is either non-consequentialist or consequentialist and potentially dynamically inconsistent, which can be highlighted by a simple example shown here in the graph. Let's assume we, we only have two possible parameter values, both equally likely and want to have at most 50% risk to cross the target. And we assume that for our cost-effective emissions, the temperature trajectory is an overshooting trajectory. It returns to values below the target at a certain point in time. At that point in time, the problem occurs. The decision maker is either non-consequentialist, remembers for which parameter the target was met in the past, and demands that it will be demand, uh, met for the same parameter in the future, or she is consequentialist, forgets about the parameter in the past, performs a new cost effectiveness analysis, and now the role of the two parameters might switch. The one that stayed below the target now crosses the target, which was not feasible seen from before the overshooting. This is not a very likely uh, example. You have an overshooting and then crossing the target again. So we cannot exclude this case, but it's not prevalent. Arguably more serious and more severe is the second conceptual flaw, which is that the expected value of information, or shortly the EVOI, can become negative. For our conceptual purposes, it is sufficient to define the EVOI simply as the difference in expected utility between the case of learning and without learning. So if the EVOI becomes negative, that means that expected utility is actually lower in the case of learning than in the case without learning. In a pure expected utility maximization, the EVOI cannot become negative. But here we have a chance constraint. And what you can see on the right-hand side is actually that the EVOI becomes negative for almost all values of risk tolerance. This can be understood when looking again intuitively at the information structure on the left. What we did was to limit the probability of crossing the target in each individual posterior. Each posterior then has a quantile, and uh, we have in each posterior a maximum value of climate sensitivity for which we have to, to meet the 2 degrees centigrade target. So we have one in the prior, the vertical dashed black line, and one in each posterior shown are the most extreme ones, the colored dashed vertical lines. So the maximum value of climate sensitivity changes due to learning, and it can, can change in an asymmetric way as, as it does here. It increases more in the cases of bad scenarios, where it's learned that climate sensitivity tends to be high, that it decreases in the good scenarios. Additionally to that, we have convex abatement costs in the maximum value of climate sensitivity for which a target has to be met. So they increase more than linearly in this maximum value of climate sensitivity. And as a superposition of these two effects, the asymmetry of the change in the quantiles and the convexity of abatement costs lead to the negative EVOIs and also to this non monotonic behavior of the EVOI as a function of risk tolerance. A negative EVOI either means that costless information is refused, which in a game about, against nature is normatively not adequate, there is no strategic interaction involved, or we simply do not use cost effectiveness analysis to assess the value of information, which in some uh, applications might be satisfactory, but in an integrated assessment model of climate change, this is really an important result, the EVI. That the EVI can become negative was f shown for chance constraint program pro programming problems already in 1974 by Roger Blau and can also be deduced from a more generic result by Peter Wacker, who showed that if an 
uh, if a decision criterion violates the independence axiom is dynamically consistent and consequentialist, which is not guaranteed in our case, then costless information is sometimes rejected. The third and last conceptual flaw of cost effectiveness analysis and uncertainty is that targets become infeasible due to learning. This can most easily be understood when looking at the case of perfect learning, where at a certain point in time, the perfect value of the uncertain parameters is revealed. In our model, the two degrees centigrade target becomes infeasible for values of climate sensitivity larger than 6.1 degrees centigrade. So if you have a prior with non-zero probability for these values larger than 6.1 degrees centigrade, and we consider perfect learning, then our target becomes simply infeasible. There are other formulations of cost effectiveness analysis with learning. In particular, instead of limiting the probability of crossing the target in each individual posterior, we could limit it only on average over the posteriors and solve this problem, but this, this leads to other problems. In consequence of the conceptual flaws I've discussed, we cannot study learning and flexibility in cost effectiveness analysis. But since we have these politically given climate targets uh, with particularly practical appeal, we have been looking for alternatives. And we wanted to have a simple decision criterion to some extent based on climate targets, and we came up with something that might be called cost-risk analysis, which is a simple multi-criteria decision analysis. The idea was to allow for a trade-off between aggregate abatement costs, capital C, and aggregate risk, R. So now instead of limiting the risk and minimizing costs, as in cost-effectiveness analysis, now we want to have a trade-off between the two. And since we want to have a decision criterion that fulfills the independence axiom, we are limited to a linear form here. So we minimize the expected value of the weighted sum of aggregate costs and risk. This is now a pure expected utility maximization, no chance constraint involved. So we don't get negative EVOIs. We don't get infeasible targets. But still, depending on the choice of the risk and the cost matrix, we can still have the problem of dynamic inconsistencies or uh, non-consequentialist behavior. For example, if we choose exceedance probability of a two degree centigrade target for the risk matrix, we still might have this problem. The main difference between cost risk analysis and the standard cost benefit analysis, including a climate damage function, is that here, at least part of the trade-off between abatement costs and climate impact of the risk is done on an aggregate level and explicitly, not implicitly in the damage function. And one might also think about a combination of the two to include well quantifiable market impacts in the abatement costs or in the costs, not the abatement costs, and only hardly to quantify non-market impacts in the risk. Now let me show some numeric results for cost risk analysis. First, we use percentage losses in net present value of consumption as cost metric and exceedance probability for the two degree centigrade target as risk metric. If we didn't have learning, static uncertainty, we can solve the problem by plotting the efficient frontier, which is done here, the black solid curve. So this is simply the minimum costs for given risk or the minimum risk at given costs. And we plot the indifference curves of our linear goal function, which has straight lines for, different, for two different values of the trade of parameter W, and look for the points of tangency. So for example, if we have W equal to 200, which means that for the given units, costs are 200 times more weight than risk, then we find it's optimal to have to spend 0.4% of net present value of consumption on abatement and to accept about 45% chance to uh, cross the two degree centigrade target. And then we can again look at optimal emissions with learning for the same two parameter values. And the most striking feature here is that for messages one to three, we actually see that for W equal to 200, business as usual emissions are optimal. Abatement efforts are completely stopped. The reason for that can be seen again when looking at the efficient frontier, which is pretty steep here at high values of risk. And if we learn the climate sensitivity tends to be high, which are these messages one, two, three, then the efficient frontier is even bended upwards, becomes steeper here, and it becomes optimal for W equal to 200 to have 100% risk, which is the business as usual. So we need a more appropriate risk metric, obviously, which gives it as an incentive also in bad scenarios to abate. And we have to take overshooting into account. That can be done by using a concept proposed by Michael Mastrandrea and Stephen Schneider, which is degree years. Degree years is simply the area between, so if you have the target and a temperature trajectory, it's simply the area between the two. 
And since we have uncertainty about climate sensitivity, we get a whole distribution on degree years. What we take is simply the expected value, but one could also take a convex function or a concave function of degree years in order to express risk averse or risk loving behavior. Again, we can plot the efficient frontier, which is now much flatter for high values of risk. So we can expect that for bad messages, actually abatement increases, which is confirmed on the right hand side. So with this framework, we now uh, can study learning without conceptual flaws. We can study anticipational effects, the difference between emissions with learning and without learning, flexibility, and so on and so forth. We have a simple criterion based to some extent on climate targets without conceptual flaws. Then let me conclude. There are climate targets politically given and influential, and they have practical advantages. On the other hand, uncertainty, irreversibility, and learning are an essential part of the climate problem that we cannot study in cost-effectiveness analysis because of the problems I just discussed. An alternative is cost-risk analysis, which is simple, based to some extent on climate targets, and without conceptual flaws. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I work at the CNRS, Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique, in France. And a part of this work was done while at the Engineering and Public Policy Department in Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, so it's more uh, uh, science and policy than pure economics. And uh, I'll talk about uh, how do you define scenarios in an interesting way. Uh, first, I will explain that uh, probabilities and scenarios don't mix well, but uh, instead we should use uh, possibility. It's an, uh, a notion that was uh, introduced by Shekel, uh, and was later reintroduced by uh, uh, the fizzy uh, set uh, theorist uh, Zadeh in Berkeley, I think. And uh, finally, I will use these tools to uh, discuss global warming. So why uh, is there a problem between uh, scenarios and probabilities? Well, for example, consider the uh, special report on emission scenarios that were done about climate change uh, a few years ago. The uh, SHS team assessed that there were no preferred scenarios and did not give any probability to the scenarios on uh, uh, emissions, on CO2 emissions. And uh, this uh, is a problem because common sense suggests that plausibility levels vary between scenarios. So some scenarios are more likely than others. And uh, if you hold the line, that there are no uh, preferred scenarios. Then uh, if you combine the high emission scenarios of IPCC with the high climate sensitivity scenario, then you arrive at uh, a very high level of uh, global warming at the end of the century, like over 5.5 degrees. And if uh, you don't have any uh, f formal way to say that this is unlikely, then uh, it uh, it means it's a very strong policy message that may not be supported by new science, and it has been criticized this way. And uh, well, actually, it's a very common controversy in uh, a management science that so that there's a distinction between uh, forecasts and scenarios uh, when you want to be precise uh, about uh, this point. So usually, people call forecasts things that have uh, probabilities when they want to uh, make a difference between scenarios where they do not want to quantify belief. And the point of my paper is that with uh, possibility theory, you can have both. So you can have uh, scenarios, but you can give uh, uh, levels of uh, plausibility or possibility, however you want to call it, which uh, have a well-defined uh, philosophical and uh, mathematical Science, uh, sense. 
And uh, another problem with uh, scenarios, which is more a technical problem, is that uh, if you describe any precise scenario, of course, its probability will be zero, because any precise point in the sea of uh, future, since there is an infinite number of uh, futures, any uh, scenarios, probability is zero. So one way around that is to say that the scenarios are fuzzy. And actually, one scenario is representative of a large number of states of the world. But uh, um, fuzziness in scenarios is another topic. So I'm just uh, looking at fuzziness and the second part of uh, uh, these couples. So I'm interested in how, how do you use possibility theory to quantify the beliefs. And before I go there, I would like to, uh, to state that scenarios are used for many things. And uh, one way is to uh, talk, uh, to try to decrease surprises, because surprises are things that uh, policymakers have not uh, been thinking about. So if the experts know, know something, they can use scenarios to talk about it and to prepare the policy makers or the decision makers uh, to unexpected events, to events that were not expected by them. Scenarios can be used to break uh, taboos. Taboos are things that should not be uh, discussed about in a social group. Um, so any social group has uh, defining uh, taboos, and uh, scenarios can be uh, done by uh, out experts outside from the group. So I could talk about uh, development or uh, uh, military issues for climate change, for example. Uh, that, uh, it, uh, scenarios have been used to explore the security aspects of uh, climate change. Uh, also in uh, strategic uncertainty, so scenarios are used in the military to try to deal with uh, surprises and uh, in uh, strategic plans. OK, but here we are uh, uh, in a, a scenarios that we try to define futures with possibilities. So what is the plausibility of a scenario? So Shackle, uh, an economist, uh, he defined the uh, possibility as the 1 minus the degree of surprise. And then later on, uh, the idea is that if something is uh, believed to be impossible. It is associated uh, a possibility level of zero. And if something is said to be perfectly possible, you said that uh, its possibility level is one. OK, but that's just the idea. Another way to say is that uh, there are two uh, intuitive axioms that uh, possibility distributions should follow. One is normalization. But uh, you have a less surprising future, and uh, its possibility is one. So it, uh, the possibility distribution, it's a function that, uh, reach, that is between 0 and 1, and it reaches its maximum. And then the maxitivity axiom, it says that if you have uh, two events with possibility uh, P of A and P of B, then the possibility of A or B uh, that's uh, just a maximum of the possibility of the two levels. Uh, so one way to get this into mathematical terms, as I said, a possibility distribution is defined as any function that uh, reaches bit, uh, its maximum one, between 0 and 1. And then if we have defined a possibility distribution on the singleton, we can define a possibility distribution on a subset by considering just the maximum of the possibility of any event. And uh, so th this is uh, the uh, early view of possibility, the view of Shekel and Zade. And now there's a more recent view, uh, which has been developed over the last uh, years, uh, which is to see possibility as a special case of uh, imprecise probabilities on the uh, multiple priors. And uh, 
uh, uh, you, you made a paper on uh, uh, Marcelo Basili, wrote a paper on that. And so you say that a set of uh, possibility distribution defines uh, multiple priors. Uh, so any uh, probability that is dominated by the possibility distribution is uh, an acceptable admissible prior. So uh, the possibility, the, this probability is uh, a prior in the set of admissible priors if it's uh, lower than the possibility for any events. So in uh, other words, it, it means to say that the possibility of an event is the maximum of its probability. So uh, it's the chance constraint, if you want. Or if you refer to the IPCC uh, uh, guidelines, who said that something very likely, very unlikely, is a less than 10 percent probability. So you could say that something very unlikely has possibility 10 percent. And if you view uh, possibility as an imprecise probability, as a bound, you can also say then uh, uh, possibility can be linked to a definitive view of probabilities. And say that uh, if you say, st stating that the possi possibility of uh, an event is uh, P, means that uh, I am uh, ready to bet that the uh, event will not happen uh, under uh, certain uh, conditions if uh, it pays enough, of course. So if uh, the possibility is zero, then uh, I'm ready to bet that it, it will not happen at any rate, and, uh, or even at very low rates. And if I consider that the possibility is one, then I am not ready to bet that it will not happen at all. But uh, the view is, of course, it's a one-sided bet. So we are saying that we have a, a disposition to bet only on uh, the uh, gamble that A will not happen. But we are not saying anything about the gamble that A will happen. OK, a graphical view for multiple priors. So if you consider this uh, uh, Ellsberg case, where there are three possible states of the world, so it's an urn with uh, balls uh, red, yellow, and black. And you consider this uh, simplex. Uh, any point in this triangle, it represents a probability distribution. Uh, or on the, a blue uh, set, it's uh, multiple priors. So this uh, blue set, it represents the idea, the belief that it, uh, any color can happen, but uh, the urn has uh, the three colors. And this is just to say that uh, possibilities are very imprecise probabilities. Because uh, if you look at uh, the left uh, uh, multiple prior, it's, a, not a, it's a single prior. But the right, on the right, it's a possibilistic uh, uh, multiple prior. It's just given by two constraints on uh, the probability. So I have a, upper pro a bound on the probability and a bound on the probability here. And I don't have a bound on the probability on the uh, red on the top because I normalize. So I allow red to be the uh, most probable to be completely possible. So having uh, said these uh, mathematical preliminaries, so my, uh, the point of this talk is to look at how we, we would define scenarios uh, if we would like to uh, quantify their plausibility in an uh, interesting way. Uh, so I assume that uh, you have a, a frame of reference. So uh, for example, uh, the states of the world. So the climate sensitivity can be between minus infinity or plus infinity or whatever. Or CO2 emissions at the end of the century. And you have uh, an objective function. Uh, for example, uh, global warming, the degree of global warming. And you have uh, ambi ambiguous knowledge 
uh, multiple priors, and you would like to build scenarios. So for example, I, I want to be able to justify why I did this uh, um, choice of scenarios. So in this figure, the uh, horizontal axis is a global warming at the end of the century, uh, which goes from uh, plus uh, one degree. So today we are plus uh, 0 0.7, I think. And uh, uh, it goes up to plus uh, seven. And I have a computed a possibility distribution based on uh, uh, subjective data for global warming at the end of the century. So I'm not going to say how I computed this uh, possibility distribution. Um, tomorrow I will uh, talk about it a bit. Uh, but uh, based on this possibility distribution, the most likely of a most, it is totally possible that uh, global warming at the end of the century is uh, 2.4 degree. And uh, I would consider it uh, interesting to pick up two scenarios in addition one of 1.1 degree warming on one in uh, 4.5 degree warming. So if I were to give uh, three scenarios, uh, a range, my range would be 1.1 uh, to 4.5 with a, a, a less surprising value of uh, 2.4. So uh, this is a way to uh, answer the problem with a uh, high figure that uh, IPCC had. So how do I justify this? Uh, well, I have a, the method I used first is to summarize my available information, my multiple priors, by assessing a possibility distribution on the objective function. So I, as I show you, I made a possibility distribution on uh, global warming. And then I uh, propose four uh, criteria to choose scenarios. The first is that uh, compared to the uh, beliefs of the experts, I should not, uh, I, I should uh, sh uh, not uh, decrease the possibilities. Then I should uh, include uh, the most uh, possible scenario. And, uh, but I, I should uh, not uh, took extremes that are too uh, unlikely, because uh, if I take extremes that are too unlikely, then people uh, will disregard these scenarios. They will not uh, focus at all on the risk, because they would say, for example, that 5.5 uh, degrees is uh, not serious. So the first uh, principle uh, is uh, to uh, not restrict the possibilities. So again, so the, my problem is that I have a, an expert who has a complicated beliefs. For example, he has a, a multiple priors that are described by a dempster sheffer a possibility dist, a, a belief function. And they want to uh, summarize this information into something simpler, that is a possibility distribution. And so, when he does that, he should not uh, restrict the, the beliefs and say that. So he should only enlarge the beliefs, because otherwise he would uh, uh, tell the policymakers to uh, 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 to do things that he doesn't think are, are really desirable. Um, So the second uh, uh, principle is to include uh, the most uh, uh, possible scenario. So this is uh, a principle in scenario making that has uh, uh, pros and cons. Because if you do a set of scenarios on the inverse scenario, there's a most likely scenario, then uh, people will tend to look only at this uh, most likely scenario and disregard the other scenarios. Uh, but this principle doesn't say that you have just to have one uh, perfectly possible scenarios. You can have uh, several. If you uh, have a flat 
uh, top uh, possibility distribution. So if you, if it happens that the possibility distribution has a very flat top, you can pick up uh, two uh, very likely scenarios. Uh, but there are uh, compelling practical reasons to include uh, perfectly possible scenarios. First, uh, for policymakers, they want to have a business as usual. Uh, for example, if the uh, socioeconomists are, are doing uh, uh, emission scenarios for, uh, for the climate scientists, the climate scientists cannot run their models with uh, too many uh, baseline scenarios. They like to have one scenario. And also, when uh, uh, experts do a scenario for a policymaker, it helps to, to, to build a credibility to show that uh, you know what is the business as usual thinking in the field. But you don't want to uh, have any uh, scenario that is uh, really better than the others. Uh, so if you consider a partial ordering to say that uh, a scenario is more probable than another, if uh, it's more uh, likely for all uh, for multiple priors, then uh, it's enough to have uh, the equiprobability in your uh, set of multiple priors to uh, ensure the fact that uh, no scenario will be uh, less likely than another. Uh, so it's not necessary, but it's sufficient. So the implication is that you do a scenario set with uh, three futures, then you should uh, take futures that are at least uh, at the possibility level one third. So that's why I, uh, in this uh, scenario, set of scenario, I draw a line at uh, possibility level uh, 0 0.34. So that's just about above one third. But then you want to make scenarios as interesting as possible. Uh, so you want to make them as uh, contrasted because uh, you want to explore the possibility space. So you would take uh, the scenarios that are just at 0 0.34, uh, very uh, uh, so as uh, far as each other as you want. So that's uh, one way to choose scenarios. And uh, using possibility, it allows to, uh, uh, to answer to the need of uh, uh, scenario users to have uh, quantifications of their uh, plausibility uh, using a, a theory that is uh, well, uh, uh, I think, uh, mathematically coherent. And uh, it can also be used to uh, to, choose, to help in choosing scenarios. And it suits well the principle of a progressive disclosure of information because you have a, a less surprising f future, so people can just focus on that. And then they can focus on the few numbers of uh, scenarios you have de uh, decided to present. And then uh, you can uh, go down to the full uh, imprecise beliefs you, you, that have been used uh, in the analysis. And uh, that's uh, my conclusion. Thank you, Min. I found it really interesting to, to listen to the talk so far today, because um, what I'm going to show you is work that we've been doing essentially coming at this set of questions from the application area. I'm from RAND, and RAND, uh, we do do you know, basic research, but we spend most of our time working with clients. And so what I'm going to show you is our sort of groping our way forward, trying to find a set of tools and methods that actually works and is effective with clients. And um, I, the, the overlaps I've seen with all the stuff earlier today has just been really neat. Uh, the, 
got a lot of mulling to see how it all fits together. But let, let me run through this. I'm going to show you a couple of examples, lay out some ideas, show a couple of examples, and hope it leads to some fun discussion. So I'm going to talk about this set of methods we call robust decision making, um, which is essentially we've been coming to think of it more and more as a method, of, method for vulnerability and then response option analysis. And the, the last part's important under conditions of what we call deep uncertainty. Um, so um, one way to start this is to say that traditional decision analysis um, you know, optimal expected utility analysis, rank strategies based on probabilistic characterizations of uncertainty, which is a key piece. But what I want to really focus on is the order here. And the first thing that one does in this method is characterize what we know about the world, about future states of the world. And once we've done that, then we can rank strategies. Okay? And then a lot of what people do then to grapple with this issue of deeper uncertainty, less precise information, is we again, we we do different things, but we do the same order. If we first get, try to get a richer description of what's going on, and then we expand. So we expand our descriptions of the uncertainty to include ambiguity and precision, and then we may expand our um, uh, our decision criteria. But we're still doing the same order. And what I'm interested in doing is, is switching the order. So what we do is we start out with the decision space. Sometimes just a single option, sometimes multiple options, and then we use the information we have to characterize, I say vulnerabilities here because we mostly work in public policy context, but if you're working for like venture capitalists, you might look for you know, unexpected opportunities. But you just use the vulnerability language. We look for vulnerabilities your decision options. So in other words, the characterization of what we know and what we don't know becomes contingent on what we're thinking of doing. Okay, and I'll get to a bunch of reasons for doing that. Once we've got our vulnerabilities, then we could say, what do we do about those vulnerabilities? You know, if we were sure we were going to end up with this scenario, what would we do about it? And then you can discuss trade-offs. And if you decide to buy any insurance against those vulnerabilities, you've got a new strategy and you iterate. Okay? And so what this becomes, there's my definition of deep uncertainty, uh, where the parties to a decision do not know or cannot agree upon the system model that relates to actions to consequences or the prior probabilities. So the probabilities are imprecise. We may have model un uncertainty. And you know, we're interested both in a single decision maker who doesn't know or what we often end up with when you're using models and analysis to facilitate discussions, you end up with a room full of people who disagree with one another. Um, and rooms full of people who disagree with one another are very good at correlating their expectations about the future with what they want to do. Okay? Um, and the features of this are we characterize the uncertainty with multiple, multiplicity, multiple views of the future, which can be either multiple states of the world or multiple probability distributions. And I'm going to show you both. Uh, we use a robustness as opposed to an optimality criteria, which I'll, I'll show you what I mean by that. And then we do this iterative vulnerability analysis to both characterize the uncertainties, but, but very importantly, to help the people we're working with come up with better decision options. Okay. Um, and I should emphasize what we're doing here is we're really doing decision support. We're helping people make better decisions as opposed to trying to provide a better description of what people do. Obviously, a better description of what people do and self-consistency of, of decision frameworks and all that is really useful for kind of groping one's way forward and helping develop better tools to help people, what, to help people make better decisions. But what we're fundamentally doing are t showing you our tools to make we claim make better, help people make better decisions. OK, I'm going to show you three examples. Um, this first one is a very stylized one, which has the uh, ability that I can go through it in all the detail. And then I'm going to show you two applications of these methods in, in two different policy areas. So this is some work we did um, where we were looking at how do you think about uh, very poorly characterized abrupt changes. So you know, essentially the abrupt climate change problem, except that the climate models were a little bit hard to deal with. We're trying to migrate some of this stuff into the work that Klaus has been doing with, with the DICE model. But we just wanted to start out with something even simpler than that. So we set up this little toy problem, which is just a lake which turns green if you put too much pollution in it. OK, and so the setup is there's a town at, on the shore of a pristine lake. OK, they get utility by putting pollution in the lake, maybe by you know, starting a tourist industry or whatever. But if the concentration of pollution gets too high, the lake turns green, it destroys everything. OK, and the game is. We have different types of uncertainty about where that threshold is. Okay? So um, this is the model. There's natural emissions. There's anthropogenic emissions. There's a nutrient concentration in the lake, lake. There's a sink. Um, the lake turns green when the sink saturates, and it starts back emitting back into the lake. And then our 
we assume that the, uh, the town citizens have uh, three degrees of freedom for their decision option. They get to decide where they're going to start, the initial level of pollution, how much they're going to increase each year, okay, and then how far below they, w in units of standard deviation of the natural variability, they want to stay below where they think the target is, okay? And again, the setup is we're having a big town meeting and we're going to decide on those three things. And after we decide, since we don't really trust each other, it's too hard to get back together then to fix them. So this strategy is going to run on autopilot once we write these things down. It's in an ordinance, we can't change it. Okay, and so the question is, what combination of those things we're gonna use? And, and the game we play is we're gonna go through, do a bake-off between different ways to think about this problem. Okay, so the first thing you do is, you know, the, the, the optimum expected utility approach would be we go and do an elicitation of where the, um, this critical threat concentration threshold is. We get a probability distribution. And then I've normalized here everything between zero and one. So we assume that the distribution goes from 0.3 to 0.9. And then we run the mechanics. And this is the optimal strategy for that distribution. And we get a mean present value of 13. Okay? And so basically, it starts there. It goes up by that much each unit, and it stays three standard deviations of the natural variability below where it thinks the target is, which is, in this case, um, at 0.8. Okay. Um, we do a very crude precautionary principle. I suppose this is a, a strong precautionary principle, which basically does optimizes the performance based on the, the known variance of the natural variability. Um, and so basically it starts very low and stays very far away. So this basically doesn't do the development at all. That's the precautionary principle. Okay, so we spend most time thinking then about what, how does one think about a robust strategy? And so there's lots of different flavors of robust strategies, at least the decision literature. Um, we've often used um, one that satisfies over a very broad range of scenarios. There's keeping options open. The one we use here, and, and we found actually, and this is for people who like the math more than we end up doing, but we found whenever we try to do all three of those robustness definitions that they're degenerate, that you know, if you start at any one, you kind of get the same answer as the others. But it'd be interesting to see to the extent one could prove that. But in any event, uh, so the, this definition we're going to use here is that a robust strategy trades trade some optimal performance for less sensitivity to broken assumptions. Okay, so this is a, a multiple prior model. So we've got lots of distributions. Um, we define the expected regret of strategy S contingent on each of the distributions, uh, whether grad is just a standard minimax or grad. And then a robust strategy is one that compares to the optimal, has a small weighted average of essentially the best expected regret, which would be over the, uh, you know, our beginning distribution, uh, then against its worst case. And so this is nice because if the wor you know, if uh, these distributions are single states, that this, at this limit is minimax, and at that limit you get the same rankings due as expected value, so essentially we're uh, doing an interpolation between an expected value and, and a minimax solution. Okay, so how does one implement that? So in this simple model, the first thing we do, so essentially we've got to create our, you know, our set of uh, distributions we're going to look at. So let's start out with our, we've got our optimal strategy, and now let's look at how it performs over each potential state of the world. So we look at a variety of values of x, uh, this critical threshold, and this is the expected regret of this strategy for each of those levels of um, the critical threshold. And not surprisingly, where the initial distribution had a lot of weight, the strategy performs well, the regret's small, and where the tails, where there's very little weight, the thing blows up. Okay? It, not surprising, it crashes. That was the, uh, that's the uh, expected value of the optimum strategy. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, that the strategy is vulnerable for anything less than 0.6. Okay, so 0.5 and below, the strategy blows up. Okay, and that if it's anything above is okay. So it's kind of a satisfying criteria. Okay, so what does that tell you? So we're, no, we're now gonna make a set of distributions which essentially put more or less weight in those vulnerable tails. Okay, so here's a set of distributions. They all normalize to one. This is the one we started with and we're just putting more and more weight in the tails because that's what this strategy is vulnerable to. That's what we care about. Okay, so the next thing we do is we now go to look at different options. And so what I'm plotting here is the respect, expected regret over the initial priors, uh, initial prior, and then the expected regret over the tail of the distribution. Okay, so here's the initial strategy, which not surprisingly has very low expected regret over the priors that we optimized it on, but fails miserably if you end up in a world where uh, you get, you're in the tail of the distribution. 
Okay, so here's now a bunch of other options. And we just get those by optimizing for each of those, those distributions. Okay, and so, you know, you can basically, by giving up a little bit of optimal performance, you can buy more and more vulnerability protection against the broken assumptions. Okay, so which one do we choose? Well, it depends how confident you are in your initial distribution. So we draw that trade-off curve. And so what I'm plotting here, I call it the odds of strategy A priors, because when we show this to decision makers, that kind of makes sense to them. But I'm really plotting a Z over one minus Z. Okay, so if you're really, really confident, you know, 100 to one odds, that you got the right initial priors, and this is expected regret, um, the optimal strategy is the best thing to do, least regret. But as you're less and less confident, as there's potentially you're more and more wrong about the weight and the tails, there starts to be other options. So if you're confident on the order, you need to be you know, 50 to 1 confident uh, to choose strategy A. If you start to be less than that, you might choose B or C. There's this other transition, which is about 20 to 1, where you switch to an entirely different class of strategies. These all start high and are more and more careful about going up. These all start low and are more and more careful about going up. So around 20 to 1, you got a big decision whether what kind of strategy, class of strategy you want, and this tells you. So basically this allows you, the precautionary one's all the way over here, so this is a way of thinking about how much precaution you want to buy, okay? The other thing you can get out of this is essentially a threshold probability for strategy A. How much weight can I put in those tails before I'm not interested in strategy A? Um, we, this is a made-up problem, so we don't do it here, but I'll show you some other ones where you can now start s putting different experts on the scale. You know, Rob, you know, Lempert thinks it's over here, you know, Hanneman thinks it's down here, and you can now let the decision makers see what the implications are of believing different experts. Okay, so that, oh, let me just, one more thing here, is I was perhaps inappropriately brief on an earlier slide when I said RDM is appropriate for conditions of deep uncertainty because there's actually two important variables. This property of robustness is not just something which is useful depending on how uncertain you are, but it's a property of the decision space, okay? So what I do here is we just reran the exact same analysis where we took away two degrees of freedom. We only give the decision, the town, one degree of freedom. Where do you start? And you stay at the same level forever, pollution level forever. Well, it turns out there's no robust strategy then. You can start high and you're up here, okay? Or you can start low and you're down there, but there's no way to get any shape to this curve, okay? So if, if the decision space is insufficiently rich, you can't get robust strategies. We didn't actually do the next step on this, which is even more interesting, is once you look at what this model's doing, it's obvious how to make the strategy an awful lot better. Um, the, uh, one thing I forgot to say about the learning algorithm is it's doing Bayesian learning on where the, um, where the threshold is, but we've played the game that you don't know, that you don't learn very fast to get close to it. Okay, so it's only when you're close to the threshold that you know you can get a good idea where it is. So if that's the world you're in, going up linearly in terms of your rate doesn't make sense. What you want to do is you want to start out really slowly and then accelerate. So if I gave you one more degree of freedom, I could bend this curve almost down to the origin. And so again, by setting it up this way, I give you information on how to make a much better strategy space. Okay, let me show you, I, I need to show you one more trick and then I'm gonna take this into the real examples. The, the, the trick is, uh, is actually to deal with these scenario ideas that, that, that Min was talking about, is I, what we just did was a one dimensional problem, just one degree of uncertainty, deep uncertainty. So what do I do if I get lots of degrees of uncertainty because in many, most real problems, I'm gonna have many, many of them. So how do I, figure out where the vulnerabilities are. So we have this thing called scenario discovery, which is essentially a cluster analysis technique on model databases and model generated results. Let me show you how this works, which allows us to project a multi-dimensional space down to low dimensional trade-off curves. So the idea is we're gonna run the simulation model for many, many different combinations of uh, model, uncertain model input parameters. We're gonna experimental design over the model input space. And then we're gonna identify those clusters of cases that highlight key decision relevant trade-offs, okay? And so it's essentially this second step. And so um, let, me let me give you some examples of what I mean by decision relevant trade-offs and then I'm gonna show you this method and then I'm gonna go and give you these two examples. I'm gonna show you California water planning where the question is under what conditions would future climate change and other uncertainties suggest modifying our current long range plan? So where's our plan gonna fail in the future? Where, where are we gonna run out of water? I'm also, um, 
with your uh, permission, discuss a non-climate example. I'm going to discuss the U.S. Terror, federal government's terror, terrorism reinsurance program, because there the probability estimates are really ambiguous. Um, and the question there is, under what conditions does this federally guaranteed reinsurance cost the taxpayer money versus saving it money? And you could see how both of those conditions would be really interesting to a policymaker. And in fact, we kind of cut through any values or other sorts of disagreements. You know, does it save the taxpayer money or not? Everybody can agree that's a useful question. OK, so this is how it works. We run the model a whole bunch of times over multidimensional space. I'm showing two here, but in the examples I'm going to show you, it's on the order of 10 dimensions. We've done up to about 40. So imagine a big multidimensional space. Each, each record in the database has got a bunch of numbers for the inputs to the model. OK, and then it's got one number for the output which we've reduced to a binary number, zero or one, zero if the, the plan worked, one if it didn't. Okay? And so now we've got this big multidimensional space where there's some ones, some zeros, and we want a concise description of where the ones are because that's what the policymakers are interested, that's where their plan fails. Okay? So sometimes characterize a big 40-dimensional lawn and some, mostly mode, some places aren't. How do you find the parts that aren't mode? Okay, so this is our database. We run a cluster finding algorithm against it, and it looks for ranges of input variables, and it draws a little box around the cases of interest. Okay? And that then is, becomes a scenario in a decision app support application, because that is a case where the plan fails. And it is something then that we can base our trade-off curves around. And the, our algorithms then optimize on three, uh, three measures. One is the density. You want mostly cases of interest in your box. So it's a truly a vulnerability. You want to get most of the cases of interest in the boxes you're using. And you want this whole projection of multi-dimensions down to a few dimensions to be done in such a way that the decision maker can figure out what's going on. Okay? Now, of course, these three things are intention. So what you end up with is a bunch of these trade-off curves. You end up with a, a decision support, um, iter you know, interactive computer interface, which we've mostly done ourselves and tried a little bit to, to connect decision makers, but ultimately the idea is to get decision makers to play. And so this is just a model we did with uh, looking at the vulnerabilities of US renewable energy requirement. Uh, and so basically what this just shows is here is de coverage and density, and so that's sort of as well as so you can get a lot of most of the dots, but not a lot of density. You can get a lot of density and not most of the dots. And this is if you constrain one dimension, two dimensions, three dimensions, and four dimensions, okay? The more dimensions you constrain, the less interpretable it is, presumably. So, um, you know, we played around with it, and we chose this box, which basically says that the renewable energy requirement is most sensitive to um, what goes on with biofuels, which is not surprising if you think about it. So, but the, one of the interesting things here is this had nine parameters, and it chose really three with maybe a fourth explains virtually all of the failure modes of this strategy, and there's essentially five or six variables, which knew, intuitively you might have thought were important, but which, in fact, you can show aren't. Okay. Excuse me? Extract three factors, and the idea is if, if, let me just do with four just to make it clear here. If here are the four factors that are important, the other five, so if this parameter is at, at the, the upper end, if these two are at the upper end of its range, if this one's at the lower end of its range, and this was anything except for that little spot, so if you get all, you know, it's an and on those, then the strategy, the, this renewable energy requirement is going to cost more than you want it to cost, no matter what goes on with any other of these uncertainties in the model, okay? And so that's, so that's what you want to, so if you were then saying, what are the risks to my renewable energy policy, it's that. Okay, so let me imply this now. This is uh, this California water management example. So we did some work for this place called the Inland Empire Utilities Agency, which is in Southern California, um, Riverside County, based around Chino. It's got about, a, they serve about a million people. They're going to, assuming the economy comes back, they'll add about 300,000. <laughs> Yeah, their economic projections were much worse than their climate projections. But, um, so they, they're at about, supposed to add a you know, quarter million or more in the next um, uh, 15 years or so. They, you know, like most water agencies or all water agencies in the uh, American West, they need, legally need to, every few years to put out, uh, to give a, a, a plan which says where they're going to get their water from in order, uh, for, in order from the issue development permits. So currently, this agency gets most of its water from groundwater, about a third from imports. 
the rest from a mix. They, um, in 05, they made a 20-year plan that said they were going to do much better with their groundwater, had a huge increase in wastewater recycling, and that's how they were going to meet this growth. They didn't, hadn't include climate change, so we came and did this vulnerability and response option analysis for them. Okay, so we looked at a bunch of uncertainties. We looked at climate uncertainties, and uh, uh, working with uh, Claudia Tabaldi, who's going to be here tomorrow, we did the, you know, the region, average of uh, 21 regionally downscaled models, and we got the, uh, uh, the, the local climate estimates, which, of course, you, know, you can think of as lower bounds because there's a lot of stuff that may happen that is in the models, but mo sure to get warmer, uh, likely to get drier, but may get a little wetter with those ranges. So that's the climate. But there's a lot of other stuff, too. Uh, they may or may not be able to implement their program. You know, uh, the wastewater recycling works well if it's wastewater recycling. If it becomes toilet, the tap, it doesn't work so well. So, um, you know, there's implementation uncertainty, and then there's a lot of uncertainty about imported supplies, water use efficiency, a bunch of other, other stuff. So there's a whole different range of uncertainties. We do scenario maps. Okay, we're projecting a lot of stuff down into to small dimensions, but we're, there's two measures of interest. This is the present value cost of supplying water over the life of the plan, and this is the cost of running out of water, the hit shortages. And so here are two scenarios which we took the, the agency through in some detail. This is one where the climate's benign, this is one where it's uh, adverse, and clearly the one where it's adverse, they have a lot of shortage, they start running out of water, that one they don't. Okay, those, that's just climate uncertainty. We now do this big experimental design over all the different uncertainties all at the same time, and they get this whole range of different cases. Okay, some work well, some work poorly. So this is the climate plus the implementation plus the you know, external uncertainty. What do you do with that? Well, as we did before, we come up with this criteria for what counts as a, a success or a failure. These are successes, these are failures. This was based on a, a cost metric saying that anything that is cost within 20% of their baseline estimates, okay, anything above that is too much. And so we get a lot of cases out here. We say, what's the characteristic of these failure cases? Well, it turns out you do the scenario discovery, and three of the six main uncertainties we're looking at come out to be crucial, which is, does it, if it gets sufficiently drier, if they have any change at all in their ability to capture precipitation to groundwater, and if they fail to meet their wastewater recycling goals. So if those three things happen together, then they're, they're likely to fail. And what's interesting here and worth noting is it's not just the climate that causes them to fail, but the climate makes their system much more brittle, and if anything else goes wrong, it fails. So it's this combination of actually external and implementation uncertainties. If you think about dealing with decision makers, often that's a big issue. Can I actually implement my policy? Yeah. Do you take into account the interaction between these um, uh, sources of uncertainty, uh, the interaction? The, um, the, they, they all interact. Or do you assume that they are all independent? I, it, I, we have not. We, they interact in the sense we run them all through a big water planning model. And so, you know, they interact within the system of the model. So, um, you know, if, if the precipitation goes down and the temperature goes up, that affects supply and demand and makes this more difficult and they have an allocation and they allocate to different users and that effect. So all that's going on. Um, we haven't said anything at all about probabilities now. So in the sense of are these correlated or uncorrelated, we haven't made any, I haven't really said anything about those at all. I'm just saying that those three things need to happen together in order for the plan to fail, okay? And then one can now look at the likelihood that those things happen together or happen at all, okay, but, yeah. What, what guarantees that you end up with a unique scenario identification? Oh, nothing, nothing. I mean, it's, it's you know, if you go back here, where, where I, um, you know, these are all, I mean, there's some differences, but, there, but there's a lot of choices and most of them look alike. Some of them can be different. And th again, I mean, this is, this is a decision support application, and so in the sense we're trying to make you know, what they do better than they would have done without this. Um, but there, it's, it, it's hard to guarantee that you, know, you haven't missed a solution that was better than the one you got um, because you have finite time with them. You know, they got a month to make the decision or six months to make the decision, so when you run out of time, you stop. Um, and again, 
you know, we've, we've looked at the simple cases that, you know, if we follow, it, with a very simple case, we can run the analysis through different paths, you know, make different choices and see where you end up. And with the simple cases, you tend to end up in the same place. Um, but I don't really have a good sense of, you know, what is the characteristics of cases where you end up at the same place where, you know, and you can imagine that if this is, the surface is sufficiently rough in some dimensions, there is a path dependence. And if you make a wrong choice, you end up down, down a worse path than if you made a good choice. And it would certainly be good to understand that in more detail. But again, you know, we're, we're feeling our way forward and trying to make, this, this agency, as I'll show you, made a much better decision because we intervened with them than because then they would if we didn't. And, but it would be wonderful to know the characteristics of a space of a decision problem that meant you had to worry about path dependence and, and ones you don't, but I don't know what that taxonomy is. OK, so anyway, so we identified the vulnerabilities, and then we can do this response option analysis. We can look at a bunch of ways, a uh, bunch of options for responding to that vulnerability. The key thing that they can do is up monitor their water, uh, groundwater levels and then respond if they drop below a certain amount. These are a bunch of different plans, um, which we then plot. Uh, here are the plans. Here are um, the number of scenarios where they're, where, that you're vulnerable to. And the reason we plotted it that way is because it turns out the particular circumstances of this agency is the more they do and the earlier they do it, the more money they save because they spend less on imported water. So economically, the costs get lower and lower the more they do. But they have their opportunity costs go up because they have to spend more of their administrative and time and political capital worrying about climate change as opposed to all the other things they have to worry about. So we just plotted it that way for them without any sort of economic trade-off on the other axis. And so they looked at that and they chose that one. Okay, they're gonna do more water, uh, more water use efficiency and they'll try to update. And that's, that's what they decided to do, which we think is a lot better than what they were planning to do. Okay, let me show you this one other one, which is a non-climate example, but it has some interesting characteristics. This is, um, a study we did a couple of years ago on this uh, program called TRIA, which is the U.S. Federal Risk, Terrorism Risk Insurance Act, which is essentially free reinsurance that the federal government provides to insurance companies if they agree to sell insurance against terrorism attacks uh, to businesses. So think the people who own the World Trade Center. They were finding it very hard to get insurance for buildings in lower Manhattan right after 9-11. So the federal government passed this thing in 2002 or 2003 and said, we'll give you free reinsurance for big attacks if you insure everybody for all attacks. And then in 2007, it was coming up for reauthorization and there was a big debate between sort of the free marketeers and the administration and the, the Congress about whether this was a valid federal program or not. And so we did this scenario discovery thing on, we made a model, we did the scenario discovery thing. We found essentially the scenarios where this program saves the taxpayer money versus the scenarios where it costs the taxpayer money. It was interesting because it turned out that our, our answers were exactly opposite what the Treasury Department and the Congressional Budget Office came to because our scenario was very different than theirs in a way I'll show you in a second. And I'm kind of proud of this, you know. Um, the, despite all the deep uncertainties, um, the people who like this, uh, Chris Dodd, Senator Dodd, uh, Chairman of the Finance Committee and his allies, liked the study, so they waved it around and quoted it all the time. Uh, this particular quote from the Wall Street Journal, someone who didn't like our answer at all, but he couldn't criticize our choice of scenario because we went through this very systematic process to get it. All he could say was it was really an insidious argument and we were on a slippery slope and this was gonna lead to all sorts of bad things. But the, the scenario, the choice of scenario was sort of immune to this very toxic political environment. Okay, so let me just show you exactly what we did. I've got to, let me wave my hand just to go through it. But there's a whole bunch of uncertainties in three categories. Um, what the insurance industry is gonna do, what the terrorists are gonna do, and what the Congress is gonna do. Okay, and so the insurance industry was kind of fun. We basically, you had, a, you had two system shocks that gave you some data that you could fit a model to. In 9-11, uh, before 9-11, all the insurance companies gave the uh, probability of a big terrorist attack a zero. So they wasn't in their thinking at all. After 9-11, they all dropped their insurance policies, uh, commercial insurance. And then when this reinsurance program came back in, most of them put most of them back, but not all of them. Okay, so we had a bunch of data on the two system shocks, which allowed us to fit a model of what the insurance industry and their customers do. And we got a whole bunch of models which were consistent with those two shocks, but projected at different things in the future. Okay, so that was the sort of the most data rich. Um, there's these 
companies that serve the reinsurance industry that have these gigantic terrorism models, which have all sorts of detailed engineering of, you know, if you set a truck bomb of a certain size, how much damage does that cost, all that sort of stuff, which everybody assumes is right, even though it's probably not. I think someone mentioned that, yeah, we had this discussion about the consequences versus the probability. Well, we assume the consequences are perfectly known to probabilities that aren't, so we, we did that fallacy. But then they do expert elicitation every thick six months to get the PDF of big terrorist attacks. OK. Uh, <laughs> you laugh. <laughs> and then the, uh, the model of what future Congresses do, that was just pure scenarios, OK? And th the basic question is, how much do they compensate people who didn't have insurance after their building gets blown up, OK? And so you do the scenario discovery stuff, and it turns out pretty much the only thing that matters, with one little exception, is how big the attack is. And that's actually, once you see that, it's kind of obvious based on the structure of the program. But basically, even though we had a wide model of insurance industry behavior, it doesn't really matter what that happens there. It's just really how big the attack does. And the, 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 the tipping point or the, the, the scenario boundary is about an attack of $40 billion in um, insured losses, which is about twice the World Trade Center losses. OK, and so you go through all that, and you get this sort of picture, which is really why I showed this all to you, is that on this axis is the, uh, this game of multiple probabilities keyed off your, you know, your beginning expectation. So this is the ratio of the probability of a large attack to the probability of a large attack. And this is the uh, risk management solutions. They're based down in, um, uh, not Hayward, but South yeah, South Bay. Yeah. So they're a, bi they're a big modeling company, and they provide information to uh, uh, services to the reinsurance industry. So they do the solicitation, and they came up with the probability distribution. So this one means you believe their p the weight in their PDF for a $40 billion attack or larger that occurs over the lifetime of this program. 10 means that the actual number is 10 times what RMS estimated is 100 times, and there's a tenth. Okay? And then on this axis, so that's, that's a set of different probabilities. This one is a set of different states. And this is what percentage of insured losses or non-insured losses that Congress compensates after a big terrorist attack. Okay? And what's basically going on here is that the, you, the, the way the program is supposed to work, the government gives, re gives the free reinsurance, which means that the insurance industry will sell more insurance. And if there's a small attack, the insurance industry pays. And only if there's a big attack does the does the, um, does the government pay, or do we pay? And so in, in this region, this program saves the taxpayer money on an expected value sense. And over here, it costs the taxpayer money. OK, so in sort of typical fashion, the way this is done is the Congressional Budget Office and the US Treasury need to estimate what the uh, comp post-attack compensation was by Congress. And they chose, because you don't know what the number is, zero, right? Because that's what you do if you're an agency. And, you don't know what the number is. You just assume it's zero. OK. So they assumed it's zero and use the RMS numbers. And that's it's not quite a singularity, but it's a pretty different case. So they said, oh, this costs you money. And so pretty much if, you're, if the RMS numbers are at all right, pretty much any other number that you choose gives you a different answer, that it saves you money. OK. Um, and you, know, you can make the line that there's probably no legislature in the history of the American Republic that is behave the way that that assumption goes. I mean, it's all somewhere like that. So anyway, so our conclusion on this was, given over a wide range of plausible assumptions, TRIA actually saves the taxpayer money. OK, and that's uh, the staff, congressional staff saw this chart. You know, the senator took away, oh, it saves you money on balance. And you know, that, that was the number in the debate. And that's the thing that the, um, the, the Wall Street Journal criticized. Um, there was almost an interesting discussion about how Congress would deal with the pay-as-you-go rules, um, given this information. But then I think Barney Frank figured a way around that. But, but in any event, th this, this is interesting because uh, I show this to you because it has sort of these two very different types of representations of uncertainty, and then also shows sort of how the official planning agencies deal with these, these numbers. OK. Um, this is why use regret is a measure, which I'll, which I'll skip. And just to then to summarize, um, RDM characterizes deep uncertainties as vulnerabilities to proposed robust strategies. And so we have multiple descriptions of the future. We can be you know, probabil multiple probabilities, multiple state spaces, or some mix. Um, the robustness criteria, and I showed you the, um, actually, really, I showed you two, two criteria. One is uh, the giving up some optimal performance for less uh, sensitivity to broken assumptions. And the, the TRIA thing I showed you is really working well over a wide range of plausible futures. Um, and then the idea is we deploy the decision framework based on 
doing, sort of turning around the normal order, doing the vulnerability analysis so that your uncertainty characterization is, is um, contingent on the options you look, decided to look at but it allows you then to go to this iterative process to try to find better decisions. And some benefits, you know, the, one of the costs of this is it's computationally kind of expensive, so it kind of relies on cheap computation. But uh, you also need a model as opposed to some other qualitative techniques. But um, it gives you a means to collapse many dimensions of different types of deep uncertainty to low dimensional trade-off curves and then the decision makers can work with. Um, allows you to quantitatively compare trade-offs among decision options, so sort of this idea of how much precaution do you want to buy. Um, you can try to get a criteria for successful description of the uncertainties by how well it helps people understand the problem and come up with better options. Um, I didn't talk much about this, but you can play this game of um, asking people to game this, the model. Once you show them the model, and say, what, what's not in the model that would cause this robust strategy to break? And we've done a little bit of that. It's a way, it's, a, it, it's both, a, a, it's a constrained way of, you know, sort of blue skying things because you're looking not for something that totally changes everything. But not, not only, it doesn't just change the, the, the performance of the strategy, but it changes the performance of the strategy in relationship to everything else that you've considered, which is a much harder funnel to get through. Um, and, and then it also tells you, though, what you do with those surprises. You draw the trade-off curves. And then this, uh, I think Min is trying to get a little bit about this. So from the scenario literature, there's this notion that if you have a sense of possibility and not prediction, you can actually go into a room full of people who believe very different things because they believe in very different, they want very different policy options to come out the best. And if you come in with this scenario notion, which has, retains the notion of possibility as opposed to prediction, I'm not going to prejudice which is more likely, I'm just going to show you what it looks like as a function of a lot of different assumptions. You can help build consensus among those holding different worldviews. They, you know, we do this with these charts where, you know, you believe this, on this corner, that makes sense. You believe that, in that corner, that makes sense. Let's find something that sort of works over the range because neither, we're not, no one's going to convince anybody other, the other side what corner you're in. And there's a bunch of papers. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry, it's a lot of stuff. <laughs>
as these things go, I mean, the, 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 the data is, is you, you end up with a very, you know, not a lot of people come to all the same workshops, so your end is pretty small and all that sort of stuff. But there is, is a sense in, at least with the small number of responses we got, that people um, had a much better understanding of both the problem they faced and their options you know, in the normative sense, is that their, their understanding of the climate change challenge was much more consistent with, you know, what the scientific understanding was, and their understanding of the different options was much more consistent with the, uh, with the options were. And that, um, you know, while at the end that trade-off curve is, is kind of subjective, you know, because it's, it's their opportunity cost, um, it's um, that by, you know, the judgment of a lot of people, perhaps even including the decision, you know, the, the, the leaders of the agency themselves, that they probably should have had more conservation in their initial plan, and this analysis helped them get there because it gave them a structured way to both, you know, it, it gave them a way to think about why that was the case in a way that they could articulate it to their, their stakeholders. And so, and that's, that, that is the loose sense, which I'm saying it's a better decision, but you're absolutely right. It would be really useful to have, you know, even better metrics of that so one could measure it more precisely. I have two, two questions now which related to um, uh, technical aspect. Uh, the first one is the definition of uh, vulnerability, because if you consider damage times probability, you have a lot of problem when you define uh, uh, extreme events with a very, very large catastrophic uh, consequence and uh, very, very small probability. The second one is a respect to um, definition of a multiple dimension. Uh, if you consider a multiple criteria of decision making, you are assuming that the criteria are independent because uh, they are summing up to one. But uh, if you uh, relax this assumption, you have to introduce uh, uh, non editing of fuzzy measure with respect to this approach. And then you, you need an axiomatic part or a different uh, uh, way of combination of this criteria. To, and you could uh, obtain a, a different uh, outcomes of the courts. Uh, because the weight of, uh, of uh, if the, the dimensions are not independent, uh, the, the weight of each dimension is related to uh, a, a sort of optimization uh, rule inside the, 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 uh, uh, the framework. That is, in, in the specific, you have to apply a maximization of entropy, in this case, a particular kind of entropy. And uh, the definition of the, the, the value of each dimension is related to uh, the solution of this problem. That, that is all. What your first question was again? I, that, that, you, you asked two questions, right? The, the first one was. First one, respect to vulnerability. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, yeah. Um, on the vulnerability, the um, the vulnerability is is um, defined as a as the set of states of the world where the plan would you know, would, does not meet a performance criteria, would not meet a performance criteria if, if, if you get that state of the world. And so um, it's, it's, we're using it in a way that has, does not have, yet have the probability attached, okay? So it's just, you've got multiple states of the world, what state, in which states of the world would your plan, would your strategy not meet its performance criteria, okay? And so that's, that's what we mean by vulnerability. Um, the probabilities are attached when you ask the question, um, what might I do about that vulnerability, and is it worth doing, you know, taking action to, to, to reduce it? And then you can um, essentially come up with a probability threshold, and you can say, how likely would those states have to be in order to justify, or in order for me to feel comfortable taking that, that action? Um, on your second question, um, Everything I showed you is essentially, you know, single attribute decision making. We, we, we're, we're trying to expand this into multi-attribute, but, you, you know, um, we'll get there, but it, it, it makes the dimensionality reduction harder because you have to draw the trade-off curves and, and multi, you know, for both your expectations and, and your values. What, what I meant by multiple uh, dimensions here are um, 
I mean, literally what it means is you've got a simulation model with a bunch of input parameters, which each of which has uncertainty associated with it. Um, and the way that you would deal with that um, you know, in an expected value sense is you put a joint probability distribution over all the input parameters. And what we're doing is we're saying, let's instead start with just making a big database of over an experimental design over all the different combinations, okay? And then if you wanted to, you could do the expected value calculation by just putting the joint probability distribution over this database and you get your, your moments of your expected value. Um, but what we're going to do instead is we're going to look at the, the characteristics of the database and see what, what combinations of parameters over what ranges um, are most predictive of the cases where the, the plan is going to fail. And then we can ask the probabilistic question, how likely would we have to believe those states were in order to justify taking action against them? Does that answer your question? Yeah, a comment for Min. Um, the illustration you had was of a, a generic three ball earn problem where all the probabilities were uncertain. Uh, for the Ellsberg problem, one of the probabilities is known. The, um, uh, yeah, we know how many red balls there are, so that means that the space of probabilities, probability distributions that's feasible is actually a line segment, not a, um, not a two, yeah, with that reduction. And I think that's, it'll be useful to have that distinction in terms of exposition because typically we're going to have a mixture of probabilistic, you know, crisp probabilities and, and then possibilities in any sort of decision problem. So, so I think you could, in terms of, well, both in terms of getting the Ellsberg story exactly right, which is it's a line segment, not a, uh, a part of the triangle, and in terms of expositing the ideas, it would be nice to, to, to do things that way, I think. This is a question for Mateus. Could, could you say a word about why the inclusion of chance constraints leads to dynamic inconsistency? Because it seems to me that, that you could you could just think of the, the probability of crossing a threshold in the next period as being a state variable, and, and it, it evolves stochastically. So, I, so it seems to me that I could include a, a chance constraint in a, in a just write it as, as a standard uh, stochastic uh, control problem for which there obviously is no dynamic inconsistency. If I understand you correctly, the problem would be that it does not correspond to what we understand under a climate target probably. What could happen if you have different values of the parameters, different uncertain values, and actually seen from now, over the long run, all these parameter values could cross the target, but at different times. So at each point in time, you have your probability to cross the target below your normative parameter, but all the parameter values actually cross the target. So if you want to take uh, path, con, uh, path dependence into account and tipping points, this is not adequate. Well, I mean, you, you know, it, 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 may, it may be the case. So, so it, it sounds to me like just a, uh, an optimal control, a stochastic control problem with the state constraint. And, and it may not be possible to, to keep the state, that is, the, the probability, this particular state, the probability that the temperature crosses a threshold. It might not be possible to keep that probability within the, 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 the desired range. But, but that's not because that doesn't signal a dynamic inconsistency problem. That just means that there's something about some problem with the way you've specified the problem. And instead of requiring that the, that the state variable remain in the set, you've got to just penalize it from, from leaving the set. And so I'm wondering whether, whether you don't have state contingent policies or, you know, I mean, if you, if you were to solve this as sort of an open loop problem, then obviously you'd get dynamic inconsistency, but that's not what we usually think of as, as being dynamic inconsistency. That's just a feature of open loop solutions. It is a closed loop solution that we do, yeah. It's not an open loop solution. So maybe we should say again what the dynamic inconsistency is. So we, we plan our emission trajectory, and once we 
have our overshooting trajectory and return to the values below the target, we revise our policy. Because now we think it might be, it might be less expensive to keep the other parameter value below the target. And this wasn't possible from, from the beginning. So this is what I understand on a, uh, as a, a dynamic inconsistency that we don't even need learning. So we don't need any open loop or closed loop solution. We just have one plan that without new information, we want to change after some time. Do you, maybe maybe I've got a different uh, notion of dynamic inconsistency. Um, you you mean you need some new information and uh, only then dynamic inconsistency can arise? Do I understand you correctly? Yeah. What I understand on the dynamic inconsistency can already arise without uncertainty. Actually, you can just have a plan and you go. Nothing changes in the system, and you knew it right from the start. But the, the decision criteria tells you after some time that you want to do something else. So that's dynamically inconsistent in my in my view. Yeah, in my view too. But but, but I, I just don't see how that occurs in this problem. So, I mean, you don't understand how it occurs? Yeah, or do you have a solution how to avoid it? So so you, you, you said that, that the presence of the chance constraint is what gives rise to this. Exactly. The non separability the, the non time separability. As a as a guess on this, maybe I'm I'm wrong. It seems as though you've got in the initial period, you've got a um, you, you've, you've got a chance of falling. You, you want to stick to a chance of falling below the uh, below the threshold. And implicitly, if you yeah, if you're planning for all the possible states of nature, which include the signal as well as the as well as the initial information, you'd be planning mostly for the worst. You'd be planning mostly for the worst state. For exactly. The worst, that's, for the that's, worst message. that's another problem. Exactly. And and then when when the, but when the message is revealed. Suddenly, you reclassify relatively good states, uh, relatively good states with a bad message as being less important, and relatively bad states with a good message as being more important. Exactly, and that's how the negative and that's, that value gives you of information comes out. But that's not the dynamic inconsistency. Well, indeed, the value of information and dynamic inconsistency are almost the same thing, aren't they? I mean, I think it's best if you don't use the term dynamically inconsistent, but maybe that the policy okay. changes if you hit a constraint or something like that. But okay. because it has a very specific context to do with expectations or why you might change your policies after a while and that's not in that's not in your model or not in your in your story. So I would call it something different. That obviously uh -huh. when you hit a constraint then you might change the nature of your policy and that's all that happens. Mm -hmm. So so actually I have a question which is some somewhat related to what we just discussed. Um, if I have uncertainty about different aspects of, of, of my model, why do you necessarily assume that what my target is has to be fixed over the whole time? What might be a very reasonable policy target today not, must not necessarily be a, 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 a reasonable policy target if we see that the world evolves in, in a somewhat different way than we have uh, perceived in the, in, in the current situation. Absolutely, and I think that's more or less what cost risk analysis does. It adjusts the risk we want to take depending on what we learn. If it becomes more expensive to have a certain percentage of security to uh, uh, observe our target, uh, it, then we relax it. You're absolutely right, but you have to formulate a rule according to which you adjust your target. And that's what cost risk analysis do, and probably other possibilities exist. If I could throw in a real, yeah, a real policy example of this in the climate change debate, there's a, yeah, st still an ongoing debate between emissions trading and carbon tax type schemes. And what, what you see, you know, I, I would say you can make a fairly strong ex ante case that if you're concerned about quantity certainty, you want, um, yeah, if you're concerned more about the risk of getting your emissions wrong, you want, um, you want emissions trading. What we've seen, though, is that we bring in emissions trading, and then we have a big recession, and suddenly the cost of um, you know, the cost of reducing emissions falls a lot, and so a bunch of people who were in favour of emissions trading are now suddenly saying, no, we should have carbon taxes after all because uh, you know, because it's cheap, we can now get much more action out of the carbon tax uh, than we get. You know, the emissions people are meeting their emissions trading for free because they're shutting the factory down anyway. If only we had a carbon tax, things would be better, and so. Uh, 
you know, I, I would offer the counter, well, ex ante, the, the emissions trading is working as a counter cyclical measure, which is good, but, but you certainly see precisely this kind of inconsistency in people's positions, um, which ultimately reflects the fact that as a collective decision problem, we don't have you know, dynamic consistency and consequentialism all satisfied. I would have a question uh, either to Min or to our theorists, actually, about the relation between the possibility idea of comparing these scenarios and the model that we saw earlier. Like, for one special case, you actually compared your possibility sets to dempster Schaefer and you showed the relation. Um, is there, like, a general relation how they... Because dempster Schaefer is a special case of most of the ambiguity models that we saw in the morning. Is there kind of a general way to relate these models or...? Well, in, in my view, uh, Dempster-Schaeffer is a special kind of uh, multiple priors where you have a, a very uh, convenient uh, mathematical operators to work with. And uh, viewing a possibility theory as a special kind of De Dempster-Schaeffer, I think it's uh, uh, more controversial because uh, uh, it's... Uh, maybe a more recent uh, case. But it's well known that uh, con consonant uh, belief functions are about the same thing as the possibility distributions. Repeat the last sentence, please. Sorry. Uh, well, there's a special class of uh, possibility of uh, belief functions, of uh, dempster schaeffer belief functions, which uh, are known to be a uh, very close to possibility distributions. If I, if I may add, possibility, possibility functions are capacities. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and uh, I think with the choice model is using, you may actually not use the Chouquet integral, but, but it's dual version, the, the remember, the upper Chouquet integral instead of a lower Shoke integral. But anyway, so the, 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 the model that he's using is actually Shoke expected utility. I, can I add one for little things? That, that um, they are capacities, but um, um, they're not necessarily um, convex capacities. That, that, that has, uh, I mean, Paolo much, could say much more about that, but uh, so um, what needs to be studied is the relationship between possibility theory and the ambiguity attitude uh, um, uh, rather than the, just the, the ambiguity model because, uh, uh, because uh, I mean, Paolo already talked about that, but um, the one should uh, develop further the point between the uh, possibility theory and the structure of the capacities that would allow a similar representation. Which, I mean, not, it's not sufficient to say their capacity, but which type of capacities. Um, am I right, Paolo? Y yes, but <coughs> one of one of the reasons why uh, possibility and what's the name of the of the dual I don't remember um, uh, necessity have not been uh, very successful in uh, decision theory is because they don't give they give rise to a decision rule that is what we call probabilistically sophisticated so you don't you cannot explain the Esber paradox which is why people that have been uh, interested in ambiguity didn't use them uh, I mean, they're you know they're nice in many other ways, but uh, they are not uh, very helpful in dealing with Ellsberg. Uh, of course, climate change is not Ellsberg, so it's you know I'm not I'm not saying I'm not making any statements here. To just throw one more thing in on that, I, I guess it seems to me the more promising direction with possibility uh, is not is not a numerical version of it, but an ordinal ordinal version which has a, a small number of, of ordinal, ordinal values between impossible and certain, impossible, possible, likely and certain, something like that, I think, and doesn't, yeah, doesn't then reduce to a capacity and is, is to some extent out, you know, is justified more on inductive grounds rather than um, 
rather than substituting for the, prob the probabilistic part of it. Uh, yeah, I guess that's the way I would like to go with, with possibility theory, not, not to try and make it a substitute for probability, but, but something that's outside the probabilistic part of the story. And thank you all for presenting today and being here. And, uh, we <coughs> and now uh, the drought ends and uh, there's beverages and food outside.